Well, here we are at the end. Six parts about mass spectrometry, and here is number six. So I hope you've enjoyed it so far, and if you're chiming in on the last part of it, you probably want to go back and w watch episodes uh, one to six to get an idea of the background of what I'm talking about. Up to this point, um, we've been talking about how mass spectrometers work and how they generate data. And in the last episode, we touched on briefly how identification works. And it's obviously important that we identify the molecules that are in our sample. But while identification is really important, um, the relative change in the concentration of a molecule in the context of a disease is more important. So how do we quantitate how much of a biomolecule is present using mass spectrometry? Now there's two main ways of doing this. We can measure it compared to a standard of known concentration, which is referred to as absolute quantitation, or we can compare the amount of a molecule between two different samples or two different sample sets and look at a relative quantification where we can calculate a fold change. So dealing with the first one, absolute quantitation really requires an isotope labeled standard. You can do absolute quantitation by constructing standard curves where you have uh, a known amount of um, the standard and you do a dilution series and you can create a standard curve and then you can separately measure your standards and you can compare them back to the standard curve. That works, works pretty well. The only thing that could happen is that you may end up with matrix effects from the, the background of your sample because typically we make standards up in really nice pure solvents like water and acetonitrile. We don't necessarily make them up in the background that the molecule that we want to measure in. So for instance, if we're isolating it from serum or if we're isolating it from urine, we may not have that standard in the same background or matrix as we had in our standard curve. And the matrix can certainly have an effect on the readings that we get. One of the ways to get around this is to add an isotope labeled standard. And what these are is the same compound, exactly the same compound, except one of the elements in that compound has what's called a heavy nuclei. So they can be C13 or nitrogen 15 or deuterium. And so um, these behave chemically identically to the light nuclei. We can add these samples, we purchase them, they can be a bit expensive. Uh, we purchase them and we add them into the sample during sample prep. Now, because they're chemically identical, the heavy version and the light version are able to stay together throughout the fractionation, throughout the separation, and during chromatography, they migrate together. When they then get ionized by the mass spectrometer, the mass spectrometer can tell the difference between them because there is a mass difference due to the heavy label. So in this example down the bottom here, we have our light sample, which is our normal standard where things are all C12. And then we have another sample where they have been labeled with C13. And because there are nine places on the molecule where it can be um, where this uh, can be added, we get a 9 Dalton difference in the MS1 scan. Now, these are singly charged molecules. If they were doubly charged, it would be a 4.5 Dalton difference. If they were triply charged, it would be a 3 Dalton difference. So you can see in this case, if this molecule from the light sample and the heavy standard are at the same intensity, they must be in equal amounts. And therefore, if we added... Um, one, uh, one millimolar of the standard to the sample, and these are equal, this must be one millimolar in the sample. Same with this guy. In the sample, it is far higher than the standard, and because we can say that this could be half a millimolar, this could be 
three or four millimolar, depending on what this is, but we can do an absolute quantitation based on the amount of standard compared to the sample because they both ionize with exactly the same efficiency. And so we can make that direct comparison. You normally do absolute quantification by selected reaction monitoring. So we, we talked about this before where uh, selected reaction monitoring, because you can target, you only let one parent iron through and then you sequentially look at the different transitions. Um, you can increase the sensitivity up to a thousand fold depending on the molecule. And you must know what you're looking for. When you do this with heavy isotopes, what you would then do is you would have uh, the heavy isotope version. Firstly, you would transmit the light version. Then you would transmit the heavy version and measure the transition of the light version immediately followed by the transition of the heavy version. And you would do this for all of your different transitions. What this looks like, and we've seen this slide before, is... Um, this is what a full scan of a particular peptide would look like. But what the mass spectrometer actually shows us is this information here, where each one of these uh, chromatograms reflects one of the fragments of the peptide. So in this particular case, um, let's say that Y6 gets transmitted, and in, in this case, it's the one that's down here, so it's likely to be this green transition. Y5 gets done next. It's more intense. It's likely to be this red transition. Y4 is the most intense. It's going to be the gray transition. And Y8 is the lowest. Uh, sorry, Y3, which is out of shot here, is going to be this one down the bottom here. So you can see that nothing much happens. It's monitoring each of the transitions over time, nothing much happens until it flows out of the chromatograph, gets ionized, and then you start measuring uh, the intensity. So we collect this one for a period of time and we plot a point. We collect the next one and we plot a point at roughly the same time. It will be, a, it will be about 50 milliseconds apart. The next one 50 milliseconds later, the next one 50 milliseconds later, then we go back to the start and we go, right, the intensity is actually up here, then 50 milliseconds later, 50 milliseconds later, 50 milliseconds later, come back to the next one, we plot up here, and so on and so forth. And that's how we can get a, a peak like this. We want, preferably, we want eight to 10 points across this peak at least, um, so that we get a nice peak shape and good quantification. Now, when we do this with uh, internal standards, like I said, we add, in the case of peptides, we can add the heavy isotope labeled peptide to the sample. We do our digestion. The heavy isotope labeled uh, standard is in there as well. It's been labeled through this lysine. They chromatograph together. and But firstly, for 50 milliseconds, we only transmit the light one. We create fragments and we measure one of those fragments and we get a peak area over time for this fragment. But immediately after monitoring this transition, we monitor the heavy one and we get the same thing over time where we measure the intensity and the area under the curve of each one of these. And because we know how much of this internal standard we added, we can calculate how much of the unlabeled peptide there is in our sample. Now, what I wanna make really importantly clear here is that you can only quantify the abundance of the same molecule. So you can only heavy label an analog of the thing that you want to look for. You can't use a different peptide that's heavy labeled because the ionization efficiency is different and they won't relate. A variation of, um, sorry, not a variation. Another way of doing this Rather than doing selected reaction monitoring, where you look at one parent and then one fragment of the parent for 50 milliseconds and then another fragment and then another fragment, is actually to monitor all of the fragments at the same time. So, you know, so this is what we were talking about before with selected reaction monitoring. We let uh, one peptide through out of the mixture. We fragmented into lots of fragments, but then we only measure one of the fragments at a time.
In parallel reaction monitoring, we tell the mass spectrometer for 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, only let one of them through, fragment it, but then measure all of the fragments. And we would do this in either a time of flight or an orbit trap detector. What this means is that we've got more fragments with which we can do quantification with. So when you look at this, when you look at a, a mass spectrum over time with the intensity in this direction, you can see that the fragments from the same peptide all occur at the same retention time. And if we actually look down this series, we get a diagram that looks like this. So when all of these curves line up in space together, because the measurement of these is all being done in exactly the same scan, so these intensities should line up with each other and they should all increase together and they should all decrease together because they're all coming from the same peptide. So in this case, rather than having one, two, or three transitions with, with which to uh, do your quantification, you can do it with all of the potential fragments that you get. And that it now becomes more reliable and you have more data points on which to uh, quantify the abundance. It also results in a shorter acquisition time because rather than spending 50 milliseconds on each of the fragments, you can spend 50 milliseconds collecting them all and then go to the next one. So your duty cycle becomes a lot shorter. For some fantastic information on how this is done, I direct you to the um, places down the bottom here. Skyline is a wonderful resource for not only parallel reaction monitoring, but also for data independent analysis, which we're going to talk about soon. But also Lindsay Pino's talk here, um, uh, from Northeastern University's uh, conference is fabulous. I really recommend that you watch it. Oh, and one point that I forgot to make with this diagram here, this is showing how you can actually do this also with heavy labeled, uh, heavy labeled standards, where all you need to tell the instrument is what was the heavy labeled. Now, in this case, we heavy we would have heavy labeled the arginine. That adds um, because there are ten carbon atoms in the heavy labeled arginine, it adds 10 Daltons. But because it's doubly charged, the difference between the light version and the heavy version is five Daltons. You need to tell the mass spectrometer, transmit this one, and then immediately after, transmit this one and monitor them. So you can see that they're slightly offset in where they're um, being detected, but that's because one's being selected and fragmented, and then the next one immediately is being selected and fragmented. So again, you can measure the area under the curve of, in this case, the blue trace, which is the heavy labeled one, um, if you spiked it in and you knew how much was there, and then you could do absolute quantitation based on the area under the curve of this one. You could also use it for relative quantification um, using things like SILAC, which we're going to talk about a little bit further on in this presentation. So that's parallel reaction monitoring and those targeted methods. I just want to take a step back and talk more generally about all of the different ways of quantifying. And this is, yes, this is mainly focused on proteins and mainly on peptides, but it also um, relates to metabolites and to lipids. So what we want to do is we're measuring the abundance of peptides that come from proteins. We're then normalizing the abundance um, from, of different peptides from the same protein to infer changes in abundance of the protein. We then compare this between samples like control and treatment. And in mass spectrometry, we're doing identification before we do quantification. This will become important later in another lecture when we talk about electrophoresis and 2D electrophoresis, where it's the reverse. You quantify before you identify. Now, in just as a side note, in mass spectrometry, what we're doing is we're quantifying open reading frames rather than proteiforms. And something that I want to bring to your attention is this whole idea of protein inference. How do you assign a peptide that could belong to multiple open reading frames? And there's not a really good answer to this. So why do people do this kind of liquid chromatography mass spectrometry uh, method for quantifying things if we're not qu directly quantifying proteiforms? 
because it's pretty well automated and we can do it unsupervised. We can all, there's also a lot of options for doing metabolic and isotopic labeling that allow us to mix lots of samples together and run them at the same time to um, decrease the amount of instrument time. So here's the kinds of flavors of quantification that we can do. Label-free quantification is the simplest where you just um, run your samples separately. You measure the areas under the curve and you look at you do relative quantification based on the ratio of the areas. So in this case, whatever this peptide is, there is twice as much in this particular batch of cells than there is in this particular batch of cells. The problem with doing label-free quant is that you would need to do each of these uh, samples in technical triplicate to make sure that what you were measuring was actually accurate and real and not something weird going on with the mass spectrometer. So the amount of instrument time that it takes to do a large number of samples becomes excessive. Metabolic labeling is a way to get around this where you label one set of samples, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes. You label one set of samples with heavy isotopes, you mix them together, you digest them to peptides, you separate them, and the same peptide from the different cells migrates together. They come out in the same MS scan, in the same parent ion scan, and you measure the difference in, in intensity between the light version and the heavy version in the MS1 scan. And again, you do relative quantification. Another way of doing this is by uh, uh, chemically labeling samples where you extract the proteins, you make peptides, you chemically label the peptides of one sample, uh, of both samples, one with a light version of something like formaldehyde and a heavy version of, of formaldehyde, mix them together, separate them out, and you do relative quantification in the MS1 scan. Another one is to use what's called isobaric tags, where we extract protein, we create peptides, and then we label those peptides with some isobaric tags, where in the MS1 scan, the, the same peptide from the two different samples has exactly the same mass, but when we fragment them, we release reporter ions that we can then do the relative quantification on. And the last one is the one we talked about before where we can spike in heavy label peptides to allow us to do relative or absolute quantification. So firstly, I want to talk about data dependent acquisition because it's the most common form uh, for a number of years. It's been around since the mid 90s. And you can simplify this by basically saying what you're doing is select the peptide or select the molecule smash it to pieces, and then measure the mass of the fragments. So it occurs in two steps. The first step is the MS1 scan, which shows you what intact ions are present. The MS2 scan depends on what is in the MS1 scan, and that is why it's called data dependent. And so the mass spectrometer will do an intact scan. It will look at the intact peptides or the intact biomolecules that are in there, it will select one, smash it, measure the mass of the fragments. It will normally do that for each one in, this, in that parent ion scan, normally up to 10 or 12 in a row. Once it's done those 10 or 12 MS, MS scans, it then goes and does another parent ion scan to see what new is in there. It ignores what it has fragmented before, fragments the new things and collects an individual MSMS scan for each intact peptide that's in there. Um, and it just keeps repeating this until the end of the chromatography or the end of the, the end of the run. Now, what's wrong with this? Some ions that are present in the MS1 scan may not get selected for fragmentation and may not produce an MSMS scan that you can then identify the peptide. And in data-dependent acquisition, the majority of the time, if there's not an MSMS scan for a peptide, that peptide will not be identified. If there's not an MSMS scan for the lipid or the metabolite, it might not get identified. It depends on how you do your quantification. Why won't they be fragmented? Because there's not enough of it to be 
uh, selected. It doesn't trigger an MSMS scan. Or there's too many other ions that are in the list to be fragmented before that one. And by the time it comes out of the chromatography column, alludes to its maximum and then back down again, it may have been missed in the cycles that the mass spectrometer was spending fragmenting other things. What this can do is it can result in what's called missing values in replicate analyses. This is something we'll talk about briefly in a few minutes. So this is kind of what it looks like. So what we have here is this is a chromatogram and at each 100 milliseconds under this in, in a vertical direction is an MS1 scan. And so we do, the instrument does an MS1 scan where it measures the masses of the intact molecules, in this case, peptides. And it adds up the intensity of all of the things that it finds, all of the things that it scans, and it plots a point. And so the, more, the bigger this line is, the more intensity or the more things that were in the MS1 scan. It then looks at the MS1 scan and goes, okay, what am I going to fragment? So in this case, it selects this one, smash, selects this one with the quadrupole, uh, sorry, selects that one with the quadrupole, takes it through to the collision cell, creates fragments, and then measures those fragments in the Orbi trap. And that's, the, that's what this spectrum looks like. It then selects um, the next one, um, which is at, uh, this one here, again, so, uh, selects it with the quadrupole, transmits it to the collision cell, fragments it, sends it back to the Orbi trap, gets measured, and you end up with this spectrum. This one down here in the grass ends up with this spectrum. This one down here ends up with this spectrum. Um, and then it will do another MS1 scan and look at what is in that MS1 scan and fragment things again. How do you then do quantification? So this is the total ion chromatogram that we saw before where everything in an MS1 scan is the intensity of everything is added together and a point is plotted. If we want to measure the intensity of this one here, which is glufabrinopeptide, we can say to the software, show me only where this molecule is. And so you get a chromatogram that looks like this, where at 33.05 is the maximum amount of this particular iron. So what's going on here is that you'll see this iron, if we plot the intensity of this iron over, over scan times, we can see that at this scan, there's a little bit, gets a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, and so on and so forth. In between these measurements of this intact mass, there are MSMS scans going on in the gap. So um, whatever things that were interesting in this scan would be fragmented in this area between these two MS MS1 scans, and so on and so forth. So this is actually what the this is the kind of routine that the mass spectrometer will go through. It will do an MS1 scan, sequentially fragment the intact molecules that are in that MS1 scan, and then do another MS1 scan um, to fragment more things. So the amount of this particular iron that is in the sample can be calculated by measuring the area under the curve for the extracted iron chromatogram for that. And you can compare that across samples and therefore do relative quantification because this iron in different samples that have been treated and handled in the same way should ionize with exactly the same efficiency and therefore be directly comparable. So that's DDA. And as I said, some ions in data dependent can be missed and not be fragmented. Now, one of the ways that you can fix this in software is by doing a thing called match between runs, which is what it's called in the max quant environment. Um, it's called a different thing in a few other software packages, but what it means is that if an intact mass is present in the MS1 scan, but that was not selected and fragmented in that particular sample, 
if it can be time matched, retention time matched with this exactly the same mass iron in another sample that has been identified by MSMS, the identification can be transferred between different runs. And you can then measure the intensity of the peptide or the biomolecule in the MS1 scan by inferring its identity from another sample where it was identified. And this works reasonably well. One of the other ways of doing this is actually to do data independent analyses. And this has been around for actually quite a long time, but it's only really starting to um, become prevalent and dominant over the last couple of years. And so it's only this year that I've actually put this lecture, uh, this part of the lecture in here, because up to this point, it was not something that was really being used in prime time, but now it most certainly is. So it's been around for a long time. Um, 2004 is the original data independent analysis paper. Um, and But then quite quickly after that, you have things like MSE um, and then other methodologies. The main ones that are used nowadays are these all full range fragmentation techniques like MS to the E, high definition MS to the E um, that have been commercialized by Waters, but also things like swath, um, and uh, swath and variable window swath, sonar, which is a variation on that, and, um, and that's it. Um, <laughs> data independent analysis is basically a halfway house between discovery and targeted techniques. You do need to know what you're looking for um, but the way that you can create that data um, is different to the way that you would do it when you're doing SRM or parallel reaction monitoring. And we'll come back to that. The objective of data independent is that the fragmentation of ions is not dependent on measuring them in an MS1 scan. We fragment every ion that is present. And there's two main ways of doing this. One is by fragmenting everything in the mass range, and the other is by doing window-based frag fractionation. So we'll talk about uh, the first variation here, and that it's popularly known as MS to the power of E, which has been commercialized by Waters. And the way that they do it is that they do sequential low energy and high energy scans. And what we mean by that is high and low collision energy. So the low collision energy scan transmits the intact ions. So in the case of peptides, these would be intact peptides. So you can see here, in this case, there are four, five intact peptides that are in the low energy scan. Immediately afterwards, we do a high energy scan and we fragment these peptides into their peptide fragments. And the same color fragment here comes from this, this precursor. So the red lines in this elevated energy scan all come from this one. The pink lines down in here all come from this one. And what you can then do is you can start to time align the, um, the low energy scan, the intensity of the precursor in the low energy scan and the intensity of the fragments in the high energy scan. Now, the way then that you can actually, I actually we'll come back to the way we identify uh, these molecules uh, in a couple of slides. The other way of doing this, which reignited the interest in data independent acquisition is this idea of doing window based um, fragmentation. And this was originally um, uh, popularized by SIEX with a thing called SWATH. And then it um, has also been implemented by Waters uh, as an idea called SONAR. So what um, the way that window-based DIA works, and you can do window-based DIA on thermo orbitrap-based instruments as well, is that we divide the entire mass range we want to analyze into windows of a mass width. So in this example, we have 
an MS1 scan that's performed showing us here that these are the range of peptide molecules that are appearing in the it being ionized into the instrument at a particular moment in time. Now, you don't necessarily need to do an MS1 scan for this to work. The MS1 scan is mainly there as a sanity check more than anything else for researchers to have a really quick way of looking at it and going, were there peptides in there? Yep, no worries. Once it's done that MS1 scan, it then sequentially works its way through a series of windows where um, it will select with the quadrupole everything within the range of 400 to 425, transmit it to the collision cell and fragment it and then do an MS2 scan. So in this particular case, what it's showing is that it's, do, it's done a whole lot of these MS2 scans. And if we look at this one here, in the MS1 scan between 925 and 950, we have these couple of ions in here. And when we select and fragment what's in that window, we get this collection of fragments that are related to these ion, intact ions in the MS1 scan. But again, we don't need the MS1 scan to get this. All we want is to measure the fragments that are from intact peptides in this range. And so it goes through and it sequentially transmits the range, fragments, and so on and so forth. And then when it gets to the end, it goes back to the start. What this looks like in time is you end up with a collection of fragments from the same peptide lining up at the same retention time as with parallel reaction monitoring. And this is why I said these things are a halfway house because the fragments should all align in retention time. So um, these, if we transmit the window of 400 to 425, we get these collection of fragments lining up over time. If we do this one, which is 1175 to 1200, we get a different set of peptides that are lining up. Why do windows? Because it reduces the complexity of the MS2 scan. So in MS to the E, all of these peptides would get fragmented and all of them would appear in the MS2 scan and it can get really, really complicated. Good software, and Waters do have good software, can pull this apart and actually get quantitative information out of it. It's just a different way of achieving the same thing. Now, the masses of all of the fragments occur in the same scan, which now begs the question, which fragment came from which parent iron? These are colored for the example, but it would be normal that we would not know whether this fragment belonged to the blue iron over here or whether it belonged to the green iron over here. We need software to help us figure that out. Now, there's a variation of this that is known as either sliding swath or sonar. And how that works is that you actually have, rather than doing sequential windows, you have the transmission window slide across the mass range, like it does in this example. And when it slides across the mass range, certain ions appear at the detector at certain times. And then what you can then do is you can align these back. So the as the scan is going, because the TOF or the Orbitrap, uh, no, sorry, the TOF can scan faster than the quadrupole transmission window is moving, you can align the fragments in a certain TOF scan with the particular point in the quadrupole transmission window. Um, and this then uh, allows better identification and quantification of the fragments. Now, there's a couple of ways of doing DIA data searching. Um, and so the way that you would do it with uh, sliding swath or sonar or MS to the E is because you have the, um, I will go 
back a few slides. Uh, whoops. Because you have these time-aligned fragments and time-aligned precursors, what the software can do is it can look at the low energy scan and it can say, okay, the precursors that were in the low energy scan are these ones. And it can then go to a database like you would with DDA and it can filter the database to only show theoretical peptides that are of the mass that would be the same as these ones in the low energy scan. You can then look at the fragments in the high energy scan that should all be time aligned. And that's very, very important. The fragments that occur in a time aligned arrangement, the fragments that belong to a certain precursor that has the same mass as something in the low energy scan, you can then identify what the peptide is. The other way of doing this is to use spectral libraries. And spectral libraries have been around for a really long time. Um, they've been around since the 1980s for use with um, metabolites and lipids and small molecules. Now, when you use the search algorithms that we apply to DDA data, they can be slow when they're applied to DIA data, especially window-based DIA data. With the MS to the E data, because we can narrow things down to a series of parent ions from the low energy scan, it does work a little bit faster, but it is still longer than doing a DDA search. Um, so in a DDA search, as I mentioned, we filter a list of theoretical peptides based on the mass of the precursor that was selected for fragmentation because each MSMS scan is from a single precursor. Whereas in DIA, the fragments in an MSMS scan could be from multiple precursors. So we then need to filter the theoretical peptide list to those that would fall within the mass window. And this is obviously exponentially more candidates. And the other problem is that um, the fragment intensities, when you look at theoretical peptides, you don't actually always know the intensity of the fragments. And this can also be used as another way of confirming the identity of a particular peptide. The way around this is to use spectral libraries. And normally spectral libraries are generated by doing DDA um, from highly fractionated samples. And what this means is that you can search your DIA data against real data, not predicted. Now in saying that, there is a piece of software out there called Prosit, which is part of the Proteomics DB database, which has been trained using millions upon millions of real MSMS spectra of what the fragmentation spectra of a particular peptide should look like based on its sequence. So if you're interested in that stuff, I would go and look this article up. But the other way that it is done is two main ways, highly fractionated samples, normally by doing high pH reverse phase to make fractions, and then each of those fractions is then subjected to low pH reverse phase and then data dependent acquisition to create a library. Or we can use narrow window data independent acquisition with repeat injections. And so we only do the chromatography um, the same way every time. We just re-inject the same sample over and over again to get more data. Now to elaborate on this, what we can do is we can have a whole load of quantitative samples, which we can pull together in one sample to make our library that is then representative of um, the entire sample that we want to quantify. And then what we do is we uh, take, we do an injection of this, but we only acquire data between 400 and 500 uh, mass over charge using a four mass over charge window. So we, we sequentially do four Dalton windows and transmit in those four Dalton windows to fragment everything. By doing that, the 
MSMS spectra that we get is likely to be from one peptide at any particular moment in time rather than multiple peptides at, uh, at any moment in time. So we, we continuously do this over the acquisition time for this small window. We re-inject and we do a, the next window and the next window and so on and so forth. So we do six injections to cover the entire mass range that we want to scan. Then we acquire our individual samples using a normal kind of window-based DIA scheme. And then we create a library from this narrow window DIA. That was probably really confusing and I apologize for it. For a really, really good introduction as to how this works, I refer you to Brian Searle's talk, again from the same lecture theory series from Northeastern University. Uh, there's two different videos that you can watch here. I highly recommend them. They're very, very good. Now, moving on to other methods of quantification. So what we were talking about up to this point is actually label-free quantification, but you can use those techniques to also analyze um, labeled samples. One of the original ways of multiplexing samples to be able to do relative quantification is this stable isotope labeling of amino acids in cell culture. So this was originally out of Matthias Mann's lab. And what you do is you grow parallel cells. And so you have cells in uh, a media where all of the lysine in there is has C12 in the six carbons in the lysine. Whereas in another one, all of the lysine is C13. So these six carbons in the lysine backbone are all C13. So the mass of this is six Daltons heavier than this. You, gr you grow them up so that um, this one all of the proteins that incorpor they incorporate this lysine, all of the proteins incorporate this lysine, that takes time. And then you harvest the proteins, you quantify how much protein is in, in each sample, and then you mix the two samples together in a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you have 100 micrograms from here, you mix it with 100 micrograms from here, put them together and then digest everything together and you end up with a collection of peptides where if the protein was in a one-to-one -one ratio, these peptides will be in a one-to-one -one ratio. And in the MS1 scan, these two peptides throughout the chromatography, throughout preparation, they will migrate and they will stay together. When they get to the mass spectrometer, because this heavy labeled one is six Daltons heavier, there will be a peak for the light version, there'll be a peak for the heavy version, and if they were in a one-to-one -one ratio, the intensity of these two things will be the same. For a different protein, if it's enriched in the light labeled version, you will get an intensity difference reflective of the relative change in abundance. So in this case, this particular protein was three times higher than in, the, in uh, the light treatment rather than the heavy. And so the intensity of this is three times higher than the heavy. In this one, it's the reverse. The heavy, the protein from the heavy version was three times higher. You do this for every protein for a particular peptide and you can average the amount of um, you can you can average them all to say okay the all of the peptides that belong to this protein they're all in the same ratio therefore the ratio of the protein between these two samples was one to one or three to one or one to three what does that then mean biologically now the advantages of doing this is that you can mix the two samples together and you can run them in the same MS analysis. And so this reduces or eliminates the need for doing technical replicates because the two samples that you want to compare are there at the same time. Any problems with ionizations between injections doesn't happen because they're in the same injection.
You can incorporate the label biologically, and if you do enough passages, you can get more complete and more accurate labeling than if you do chemical labeling. The disadvantages are you're actually creating more peptides of different masses that are being ionized at the same time. Um, and so you can cause iron suppression, you could cause undersampling of the peptides. The other problem is that it's very, very difficult to isot uh, to silac label an animal or a plant. Um, so you it, you can people have silac labeled mice and rats by feeding them um, nitrogen fifteen labeled spirulina, or they've done it with plants where they've grown the plant on a heavy isotope um, uh, carbon source or nitrogen source. Um, but you have to wait a number of passages or a number of generations to make sure that every single protein in the animal is labeled C13 or is labeled N15. If you wanted to do this with people, you would have to wait four or five generations. So the experiment is not happening for a century after you start the initial labeling of the person. And then you've got to get the agreement of the person to give you the organs um, that you've been growing to do your experiments. Let's face it, it ain't going to happen. This has been done in microorganisms such as yeast. This is one of the earlier papers that ever used this technology. And you can see this is a very simple um, experiment looking at the difference between haploid and diploid yeast. And anything that is in the red... Um, has a increase uh, in abundance in the diploid compared to the haploid of 1.8 or higher. Um, now, whether this this is actually um, positive or negative, um, it, it's not it, it's not really shown. Um, the ones that are not changing are in green. The ones that are going up in abundance are progressively blue, and you can see the ratio numbers here. Um, and then orange, and then red. And you can see the things that are being affected. In this particular case, um, I've forgotten what this particular... Oh, re regulation of pheromone signaling. Um, so you can see that in the diploid yeast, that these proteins are going up in abundance compared to the haploid. It's a very simple example, um, but this has been used for numerous cancer studies and uh, other studies to try and figure out what happens to protein expression um, under different conditions. Now, as I said before, um, if you can't label your organism, what you can do is you can chemically label things. And one of the original versions of doing this was a thing called iTrack. And what iTrack is that is this particular chemical molecule where you've got a reactive group that reacts with primary amines, and then you've got a reporter ion, and the reporter ions can have different heavy and light labeled isotopes. And so um, the this total tag, they all have the same mass regardless of the reporter. The 113 one, there are different masses in the balance group to accommodate for the fact that this is 113 to make the total mass 305. There are different atoms in here for the 114. To make a long story short, what happens is that you can take your organ, extract the proteins, turn them into peptides. You can only label on peptides. Label them with a single reporter combine all of them together, and then typically do fractionation, but then typically do your normal reverse phase electrospray into the mass spectrometer thing. The same peptide from different samples will appear in the MS1 scan at the same place because they're all isobaric, and therefore you're increasing your sensitivity. The reporters are only released during fragmentation, and so for a particular peptide, in this case, this one, you can measure the relative abundance of the reporters to go, okay, in whatever sample this was, this particular peptide is in four times greater abundance, and therefore the protein must have been in four times greater abundance. Now, you can do this 
up to 16 samples. So um, Thermo have made a 16 plex kit and you can see that all of the different molecules here. This is the reactive group that allows these to be bound to a primary amine. And where you see the stars is where the heavy isotopes are in the molecule. You can see that there is an incredibly small difference in the masses between these reporter ions. And in an Orbitrap mass spectrometer, you can tell the difference between these things. And so you can multiplex up to 16 samples at a time. Um, and so rather than having to run your 16 samples in technical triplicate, you can run your 16 samples once um, and have all of the reporters in the same uh, data analysis. So as I said, when we mix these uh, samples together, the same peptide from a different sample, chromatographs identical, and they are the same mass in the mass spectrometer. You only see one peak in the MS1 scan. So the mass spectrometer then selects and fragments what it thinks is one set of peptides. Um, and so what this leads is there's no increase in complexity Therefore, there is no uh, iron suppression because you've got other peptides in there of slightly different masses. You do get an increase in sensitivity because you're combining uh, samples together. And in SILAC, rather than having the heavy and light peptide at slightly different masses, and they may not set off the MSMS, all eight or all 16 samples are contributing to one mass and so your sensitivity goes up. Um, you perform this at the peptide level as the tags are not soluble, but the organic solvents that you require to solubilize the tag can precipitate your proteins. So you've got to be very careful with this. Can't do this with an iron trap. You need to do it on either Orbi trap or TOF analyzers. And there's no equivalent for your metabolites or lipids because these things happen, the labeling happens through primary amines. Most lipids, most metabolites don't have primary amines. But this has been used a heck of a lot. Again, this is a, an old example. Um, I should update it. But what you see here is in this case, the eye track label, the ones that are red are the ones that are increasing in abundance. The ones that are blue that are decreasing in abundance. This is the response of the malaria parasite to doxycycline treatment. So you can measure the particular proteins that are being downregulated, the ones that are being upregulated in response, and you can start to target or un you can better understand how does doxycycline affect malaria and can you then use complementary therapies or something else to be able to accentuate this response and cause it to kill the parasite. Now we spent a lot of time talking about proteins and peptides because to be honest, that's the majority of the stuff that I work on. But we, I do move more and more into especially lipids and slowly metabolites. Lipids are really hard because of the enormous diversity of lipids, but they are all very, very structurally related and there's a lot of isobaric species. So to point this out, we have these three lipids, which are structurally different because they have different double bond placements. And because of the different double bond placements, they will have different shapes and different conformations. And so they will be doing different things biologically. Now, the problem is that in an image, these things are completely isobaric. You will, if, you, if these three were in your sample, in an MS1 scan, you would only measure one um, mass. You would not be able to tell that there were three different things in here. If you fragmented these things, depending on where the fragmentation happens, because this double bond is in a different place, you may be able to distinguish this fragment from these two. But in this case, because the double bond happens at the same place, you can't distinguish these two molecules from each other just by using fragmentation MSMS alone. You may be able to use iron mobility because these will have different shapes and different collisional cross sections. So you may be able to get these apart before you fragment them. Um, so 
This is still an emerging field with regard to software. There are 43,000 candidates that are uh, in the database at the moment that you need to be able to wade through. And the way that we do this is again, we extract, we separate by mass spectrometry. We, um, we have to do each sample separately, typically in triplicate to be able to get our quantification and be able to understand that there is a meaningful difference in abundance, that it's not just the machine being weird. Stratify controls and treatments using PCA plots and things like that. Then hopefully have some fragmentation that will tell us what a particular mass is and then be able to do our quantification. Metabolomics is a similar idea we need to be able to quantify and identify things from MS1 scans, MSMS scans, but also from NMR. Um, we want to identify previously unknown metabolites, and we want to be able to measure their concentration and quantify them accurately. It's the same kind of workflow. And again, we use spectral libraries to try and um, tease out what's going on in our sample. But again, this is actually quite difficult. If we're just looking at the intact mass of a molecule alone, there in this particular case, um, I'm searching for an iron of this mass, plus or minus 0.1 of a Dalton, and I end up with 54 different things. And so out of, out of um, a database of 114,000 odd entries. So I need something to be able to differentiate between these 54 entries. These things are completely isobaric down to four decimal places. Fragmentation may be able to help me out of this. Um, the other thing that could help me out of this is structural differences causing a difference in iron mobility. What do we use metabolomics for? We can use it for drugs. So uh, we can use it for drug screening. We can use it for functional genomics to look at the changes of phenotype that happens after gene uh, genetic manipulation. We can look at the link between genomics, transcripts, proteomics, and metabolomics to look at human nutrition, things called nutrigenomics. And we can also look at me metabolic fingerprinting, look at the endpoint metabolites to try and diagnose disease or see how drugs are metabolized through the body um, during treatment. So an example of this is one from, again, from a few years ago, where they can look at um, the metabolic profile and the risk of people over time of developing diabetes. So in this particular case, they followed nearly two and a half thousand individuals for 12 years and of which 200 of them developed di diabetes. And they were able to look at these people that were matched um, and find out that there were five amino acids that had highly significant association with future diabetes. So if you measure high concentrations or changes in these particular five amino acids, you combine three of them together, you can pretty reliably predict whether or not someone's going to get diabetes further down the track and you can start to suggest treatment to these people. So that's the end of our series on mass spectrometry. Uh, later on in the semester, there's going to be um, another video about electrophoresis and its application to protein and DNA and RNA analysis. There's also going to be a lecture about proteomics and how proteomics can be used uh, to do diagnostics and look at biomarkers. But in summary of what we've talked about with mass spectrometry, the things that hopefully you've taken home from this is that a molecule's mass can be a unique diagnostic signature. And the mass spectrometer can measure the mass of these charged ions in the gas phase. And when we fragment these ions, we can figure out their structure um, and differentiate isobaric compounds. We can also quantify the abundance of biomolecules using their intact intensity or the intensity of their fragments using either data-dependent or data-independent analyses. We can 
ionize these molecules using electrospray typically we've talked a little bit about Maui but mainly we've been talking about electrospray electric and magnetic fields can do amazing things to separate and manipulate and move ions around to allow us to quantify and differentiate them and again one of the great take-home messages is that this is a quantitative technique and it's an untargeted quantitative technique unlike things like ELISA's or Western blots um, or other techniques that are not quantitative. Um, so I hope I've managed to convince you that mass spectrometry is pretty powerful stuff. Um, there is a number of other videos out there, most of which uh, I have referenced, um, that are really worth watching if you are more and more interested in how this stuff works. Um, what I've found over the years is that if you really want a job in science, learn how to drive a mass spectrometer because uh, not a month goes by that I don't get advertisements from various societies looking for people to drive mass spectrometers and do quantitative mass spectrometry. So I hope you've enjoyed this and I will see you again in another lecture.